Well, it's another weekend here at Papa's Custom Cars. Uh, this weekend, I'm working on a couple of different things. I've got to put in a temporary 50 amp outlet for uh, the new EV car. Um, and then I'm just going to kind of run through some of the things I discovered when looking at the different uh, EV cars and the ranges and all that kind of stuff. Contrary to what everybody says on the internet, not everything that you hear is true. Uh, surprise, uh, internet is not always right about everything. Why did we chose to get an EV um, in the family was my son was talking to me one day via the I don't remember, via messenger, and we were discussing the pros and cons of the electric cars. He's in California, and they're starting to say, yeah, by 2025 or whatever the heck the year is, everything's got to be EV. Well, in California, it's just not feasible because they don't have a grid that can hold it. Now, there's a bunch of things that are changing in California to help, hopefully help the grid. But in most cases, the grid system in the United States is so antiquated that if you were to throw a bunch of EV cars on it real quick, it would probably overwhelm the grid. Now, why am I getting one? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, when I was sitting there talking to him about it, I was doing the, the math on the miles per gallon versus an EV card and calculating the cost over a year based on you know whatever the price of the car is and the average car in an EV is anywhere from 26 to 35. And that's just a basic entry-level um, EV car. That's not your Tesla Model S and all that other kind of stuff, the Plaid and all that kind of goofy stuff. This is just a regular, standard, run-of-the-mill EV car. First car I looked at was a Nissan Leaf, um, mainly because I wasn't looking for any kind of range, really didn't need it uh, because of what we're using in the EV car for. We've got the little Chevy Trax that I bought, and I bought it because I needed a car for work that was uh, newer and would get decent gas mileage. And it does. It gets you know anywhere around 35 miles to the gallon, up to 40 with my wife driving it. So it does pretty well. It's got a little tiny motor in it and, and all that kind of things, but she's got 119,000 miles on it. And those little four cylinders don't you know, while they are built well better than they were, gosh, years ago when we first, you know, something like this wouldn't go 100,000 miles. But these new ones are built a little bit better. So <clears throat> at 120, you're kind of running a, on that edge, especially in, in this state. Most of the cars in Utah are really high, high milers. Um, but I am behind the miles that are, you know, if you factor 15,000 miles a year, I'm behind that number. So I'm sitting there and I'm doing the math on the miles per gallon and the gas and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the way gas is right now, thanks to good old OPEC, um, they've decided to cut production to raise the prices. What a surprise. Um, and because of that, we pay for it. Yes, electric cars are run pretty much on fossil fuels. But if you do it right, you're not. Um, Utah has sun roughly... 290 days a year, maybe 300. So even in the winter, there's there's sunlight here. So it's a good place for solar. If you're in Nevada, definitely want solar. Depending upon where you live, the solar will produce enough electricity for you to maintain your household. When I had my solar put in, I factored what it would take me at a maximum to run not only the house, but also the shop. And I'm running 220 in the shop, so you know I've got uh, eight sets of fluorescent lights, three bulbs to a set. Um, so I've got lighting and all that kind of stuff. And with all of that draw during the summer, I don't run. You know, my wife was saying the electric bill is probably five or ten dollars a month. We feed a lot back into the grid, and I think I've posted pictures that on my Facebook of it going backwards into the grid. And for every kilowatt we give them, we get a kilowatt back. Uh, it's changed since then, but it really doesn't matter. When I had it put in, it was grandfathered in at one and one. So we produce our own electricity. So I factored that in, and I sat down and I did the math on everything. My wife drives a half a mile to work and back. That's total. Not counting the trips to the store and that kind of thing. You know, that might add, you know, maybe... 
40, 50 miles a, a week, maybe a little bit more, but it's less than 100 miles a week. So you're looking at 5,200 miles a year. So when I factor the cost of maintaining and taking care of a, of a gas engine, you've got to change your oil every three months. You've got to change your tires. Well, on an EV, you do too. But there's maintenance that has to be done on a gas car that you don't have to do on an electric, which makes it a little bit different. So because I produce my own energy with my solar panels, um, like I said, there's 30 of them up there. Um, so I kick down about 12 kilowatts, I think it is, on the average. So that's enough to run the house, and I'm feeding the grid back in. Um, and we can usually run without touching the grid through November. Um, January, December and January, as the, as the sun's time lowers, so does the production of electricity. Solar produces power as long as there's light. Um, the magnitude of the power depends upon how much sunlight it's getting. So even during the winter, on an overcast day, if there's sunlight, it's producing power. While minuscule, it's still producing power. The only time it doesn't produce power is at night and when the skies are so dark and the, and the storms and such that, you know, there, there's just no, no light coming through. So when I did all the math, put it all together, I actually saved a ton of money by buying an EV car. A um, couple of things you need to know about an EV car. Uh, range is one of them. This one here has got anywhere from a 219 to a 280 mile range, depending upon how you drive it. Uh, if you throw it in sport mode and do 0 to 60 in 5 or 6 seconds, you're going to burn up some electricity. But if you drive it like a normal economy car, you're going to get about 260 miles to a charge. To charge it off not from the house, I'm producing the electricity, so technically it doesn't cost me anything. It'll cost me a little bit of money in the, in the winter um, because I don't produce as much electricity, but it's still cheaper than buying gas at four bucks a gallon. Uh, that's the really big effect of, of uh, an EV car. If you don't have your own sol solar plant, should you get one? Yeah, as long as you've got somewhere to charge it. Uh, for example, here next to the little city next to us, Clinton City has uh, four charge stations. They're uh, not fast charge. They're just regular charge. It takes generally a couple hours to charge your car 100 miles, 200 miles. Uh, I think it's 100 miles. It's not a lot, and it's not fast. You can go to a DC charge station, plug it in for 15 bucks in an hour, half an hour. You're charged fully. Um, for like 10 bucks. So your cost to charge, even off-site, is cheaper than buying gas. One of the other things I found uh, doing the research are there are charge stations that don't charge anything. And there are charge stations that charge reduced rates. Prime example is here in Roy, the, li the library has two charge stations. And it's like eight cents, I think, or yeah, eight cents a kilowatt or something like that. It's cheap. Up at the urgent care, uh, um, uh, up up on the main drag through town, that charge station is free. Now, with free ones, you're limited on the amount of time you can charge. But if you're rolling through a city, like my wife said, I'll just grab a book and go sit and plug in and charge off their electricity. And then there's the library. Her, her, her and my daughter, they spend a ton of time at the library whenever they get the opportunity. So while it's there, it's charging, and it's charging at a reduced rate. Granted, we're not paying anything for it here at home, but again, it's, it's one of those things you can factor in if you want to buy one. You have to put in an electrical system. Now, here's the cool thing with Chevrolet. Chevrolet allocates an X amount of dollars for a company to come in and put in um, an outlet for your EV. It's a 50 amp circuit, 40, 42 amp circuit, I think is the max the car pulls. So it's got to be a 50 amp circuit, and it's an all the time circuit. So they will put, they will subsidize the cost of that for you because Chevy wants you to buy cars from them. That reduces your cost greatly. I mean, I've got 
right now I'm putting in a temporary uh, outlet over here on, by by my power box, and I think I, I think I'm in it sixty bucks to put in a, a fifty amp outlet. I've got a thirty amp outlet right next to it, so you know either or it doesn't make any difference, and the, it's right there by the power box. So I need a piece of wire that big, and then you know all the all the normal things you need for electrical, but they come in and they put it in for you at a subsidized cost. You can also choose to take $500, I think, in, in uh, EV credits, which is basically wherever you go charge, you got $500 worth of credit. Or you can get a subsidy of $1,000. So what I found was, now remember, this stuff is all tax deductible because your EV car is uh, energy efficient, quote unquote. One of the reasons I picked Chevy was real simple. When I went down there, I initially expected to pay about twenty-eight to thirty-two thousand dollars for the EV car. Chevrolet lost the rebate because they had evidently made too many electric cars, and so the government said no more subsidies, you know, no more no more tax credits for the people that buy them, which is kind of ridiculous. If you want people to buy them, you should you should uh, give them tax credits. So what Chevrolet did on the Bolt and the uh, Bolt EUV differences. The ones in an SUV type, and the other ones, uh, it's a little bit bigger. But neither here nor there. We'll get to that when I'm in the car. But Chevy said, "Okay, well, we're going to have to do something to sell these cars." So they lowered the price on their car on the Bolts by six thousand dollars. So the original one I was looking at, by the time I added the color I wanted and all that kind of stuff. It was going to be thirty-one thousand, and then when I was done, it was twenty-six, twenty, yeah, twenty-six thousand, right around there. Anyway, so the price dropped dramatically, so that just lowered the cost of owning an EV. So now it's become even more practical to own one because a, I produce my own power, um, so I charge for basically free. And Chevy lowered the price by $6,000. That was huge. Say what you want to say about the Democrats. But they brought back the tax credit after I ordered my car. So now I've got up to a $7,500 tax credit, too, on this car. So that lowered the cost even more. So me not buying an EV for local use, and that's what it's there for, to be real honest with you. For local use was ridiculous. It would cost, you know, the cost of ownership just went from, I think I, I added paint and some other things. I paid twenty-eight thousand for this one with taxes and everything. It's around thirty thousand. Um, selling my tracks for probably six to seven thousand dollars, so that'll come off of the top. Um, I get the tax credit. I've got the electric thing where they put in the outlet for me, um, or I can choose to take a thousand dollars in credits in credit so that I can put in my own electrical, whatever works. But it's come to the point now with me and an electric car that if I don't buy one, I'm brain dead um, when it really comes down to it. Some of the things they, they talk about are recycling. Okay, And oh my God, you know, they've got to dig up the earth to get this lithium, da, 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 da. Um, you know, there's all of that kind of stuff. But what's happening now is because of the EV market, new companies are opening up that not only want your batteries to recycle, but they're designing new batteries for your cars. Like right now, they've just brought one out, I think, for the Leaf. Um, I haven't done the research a little while on the Bolt yet, but these battery packs, they're making them. And they're making them more efficient and longer ranges and all that kind of stuff. You, there are, uh, one of the companies that's doing it, there are three levels of batteries. There's the economy battery, which is just the basic what it's in it. There's a long range battery. And then there's the sport battery <laughs> for those of us who want to drive our cars fast. And each one of these has more and more technology. And what they're using is the older technology. Lithium will probably gone, be gone in a few years because battery technology has evolved greatly. There are, a, if you do the research on it, there are a bunch of companies that are delving hard into the research on these on these uh, batteries. And remember that electric cars have been around 
pretty much longer than gas cars. Um, they were making electric cars in the, what, uh, early 1900s. I don't know, if maybe even earlier than that. Jay Leno would know for sure, but they were making electric and steam. So the technology's been around, but big gas has kept it away from us. And that's where you get your misnomers and your bad information is anyone who's, who you're competing with, you're going to badmouth them. And that's kind of the way it works. It's like, you know, you're doing better. You know, I don't want them to buy electric cars. I want them to buy gas cars. So I'm going to propagate rumors. Well, to build an, a, an, a gas car or an electric car, you're looking at all the same material, more steel in the, uh, in the gas car. So you're, take, you're, you're strip mining to get that. So you're strip mining to get the battery. You're strip mining to get the metal. What's the difference? You're you're using resources on both levels. Now they're saying now there are companies out there that will recycle your batteries out of your electric cars. Um, I was looking; you can buy a battery. I think it's a Leaf battery is about six thousand dollars now, and it used to be close to fifteen thousand dollars. So the cost, because of all this technology, the costs are coming down on the EV batteries. Um, while the price of our gas just continues to go insanely high. Back to the EV car. Why did I go with Chevy? Well, Chevy was offering a, a great price on an electric car. The best range out of for that price point. I mean, it was, you know, one of these basic little bolts was $26,000. I mean, do the math on it. Then you, then, you know, throw in the rebate for the average guy. I mean, what does the average guy get back in taxes or pay in taxes in my case? You know, I'm going to pay, you know, anywhere from three to $5,000 a year in taxes. So I get that money back. So, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense not to buy this car from Chevy. Chevy's also quit making this car, which is really sad because their technology in this industry, in the, in the electrics industry, has gone leaps and bounds. There was a an EV car they came out with, the EV1, I think is what it was called. It was one of the most advanced cars ever built electric, and they crushed them all um, because they were just out there for research. Then Chevy came out with the Volt, which was a hybrid car in a sense, meaning the engine doesn't drive the car. The engine runs a generator that powers the batteries that powers the motor. That technology was really cool, and anybody who's got one will tell you they're pretty neat because you don't have to worry about charging your battery. Can you charge your battery? Yes, you can. Now we've got the plug-in hybrids. I looked at those also. That's where it's got electric power for like, you know, 80 miles, 100 miles, somewhere around there, and then it goes to the gas motor to, to run and charge the batteries back up. But you once again, you can plug in. Um, you can plug in one of those and charge your battery. And like in our instance, the reason I looked at them is because, like I said, she works a, ha a half a mile back and forth to work. So a plug-in hybrid would have been great because, A, we could have used it around town, and, B, we could use it on long trips and wouldn't have to worry about uh, range. Looking through those, the price point is insanely high. Um, everybody who's got one is getting the most dollars from them whatsoever. When I went into Chevy and I was ordering my car, I realized that this is the first time I've ever paid sticker for a car. And that's what I said to the guy when he was in there ordering my car. And he goes, no, you're wrong, Craig. He goes, on the EV cars, we're charging invoice. So I paid invoice for this thing. Even in a time where, you know, everything's ridiculously priced, car, car points, this one cost me $28,000. And this is the bigger version. It's not the advanced version that's got all the garbage on it because I didn't want it. But it's got all the basic stuff in it. It had, uh, The only thing I ordered over and above was the blue. Um, you get Because the blue is extra. Because it's, uh, you know, one of the custom colors or the really nice colors, no matter what car you buy, you're going to pay extra for it. So I paid extra for the blue because I really like the blue. With that and taking all that information, it, and, and talking to my son and going back and forth about it, I argued myself right into an electric car. The misnomers about it, you know, the only thing I can really tell you is don't listen to what people say. Do your own research. 
you don't have to take my word for it. Do the research. When I bought my solar, I probably researched 20 companies. I researched Tesla because they're the name, and I found out that their equipment hasn't changed for years. It's still the same solar stuff they had years ago, and solar has advanced so far along with the EV market. Everything is advancing.